Sapel is our tamed random voltage generator. We like to think about taming because with Sapel everything starts from a true random source, which is the thermal noise generated by the module itself. Every other aspect of its design is thus a tool for taming this complete randomness and transforming it into a musical instrument. Sapel is a double module. It contains two sections, the yellow and the green one, that are identical. We will thus focus on the yellow one for today's tutorial, implying that you can transfer the same concepts to the green one. Every section generates four random voltages. Three are stepped and one is continuous or fluctuating. The generation, however, follows the same process, the sample and hold, which we already discussed in another FRAP talk that you can find on screen or in the description. In short, we have a noise source and a stream of strings. For each trig, the sample and hold picks the noise source's value at that moment and holds it until the next trig. Since the thermal noise is an actual random oscillation, the voltage picked is different at every time and totally unpredictable. The three stepped random voltage generators have independent noise sources and a shared stream of trigs. This guarantees that all the voltages are sampled at the same time, but they have no correlation whatsoever. The stream of trig is the clock. Each section has its internal clock whose frequency we can control through its knob. The trigs are available as an output, which you can use as an actual clock or trig source. So at every clock impulse, these three circuits sample three different random voltages. To better understand the clock, let us start from the most straightforward circuit, the unquantized sample and hold. Being unquantized, it outputs every value from 0 to 7.5 volts. If we patch it to our brain source volt per octave input, we can change its pitch in a very unpredictable way, which doesn't fit any scale in the world. We can also patch it to more canonic destinations, like brain source wide section, or Fumana's scanning parameters. So if we rotate the clock knob, we increase the rate at which the sample and hold samples new random values. From a very slow rate to a very fast one. We can also use any external pulse to sample the values, for example a gate coming from Falistri, Usta or an external keyboard. In this case, I can use the end of full. You can hear that Sapel now samples a new value whenever this gate gets high. We can also use other signals, providing that they have steep rising edges, for example, a square wave LFO, which in this case comes from Brainsaw's green oscillator, or a descending ramp. Whenever we patch any signal to this input here, the internal clock will be overridden. If we patch a dummy cable, Sapel stops. We have said that as soon as we increase the clock speed, the random voltages become denser, and we can modulate the clock speed via external CV through this input here. The gate CV modulation input serves two purposes. It can modulate the clock, as we are doing now, and it can use any voltage higher than 3 volts to sample a new value. Set the switch to the right, as we are doing now, to modulate the clock speed. In this case, we are using an attenuated copy of Falistri used as an LFO. You can hear that as soon as the LFO gets high, the clocks become more denser and so the sampled values. We can also use the manual button to sample new values on top of the clock. Every time we push the button, we also generate a trig, which is available through the clock input. We can better appreciate it with a very slow clock. If we hold the button, we override the internal clock as long as we keep it pushed. So it is an excellent way to freeze our patch momentarily. 
As we said before, if we set this switch to the leftmost position, we can use any external voltage higher than 3 volts to do the same thing as the manual button. For example, we can patch this envelope here. Generally speaking, though, a gate signal or a square wave provides better results. We can use the dummy cable technique to stop SAPEL's internal clock if we want to rely exclusively on manual sampling. We said that the two sections are uncorrelated, and that is true. However, we can sum the other section's clock to this sample and hold circuit through this switch. Now we merge the two clocks over the yellow section, so the yellow sample and hold circuit will be triggered by both clocks. This feature works with both internal and external clocks and it affects the sampling section only. All the clock outputs will maintain their normal behavior. You can also see though that even if I increase this clock's speed and I generate as many new random values, the clocks that I am outputting are always referred to this clock here. Now let us go back to our basic patch and use this output here to trigger a new envelope that we will use to control our amplitude. Like this. Now there is perfect correlation between the amplitude control and the new random values. We can keep our patch more consistent by using it to control Fumana's amplitude. Or perhaps the parametric scanner width. Now let us activate the clock mix again. And it now becomes evident that these clock outputs here are referred to this clock, while the sample and hold is working with both clocks. Let us go back to our straight clock patch. As we said, the internal or the external clock and the manual sampling provide a trigger from the main clock output that we are using to trigger this envelope here. In addition, however, there is another output called random clock output. As the name suggests, it provides a clock with a random behavior. Such behavior can be either more than, where it will generate more clocks than the main one, or less than, which subtracts some trick here and there. In both modes, the random clock density depends on the global rate of change, which we will cover soon. We can use both clocks together by routing them to different destinations, for example, Prince's ping input. So, whenever Sapel receives or generates a trig, it samples three uncorrelated random voltages. So far we have been seeing the unquantized sample and hold, so it is time to move on to the other two, the quantized random voltage generators. Quantized here means that their voltages are tuned to musical intervals of the 12 tone equal temperament. The 2 to the nth power circuit outputs random semitones and the n plus 1 circuit outputs random octaves. As you can tell, these circuits have a control knob instead of the sample and hold one. In both cases, the knob defines the number of random voltages generated. The generation process is described by the circuit's name. The 2 to the nth power knob increases the number of voltages in an exponential progression, thus defining the n number. The second power generates 4 voltages, the third 8, the fourth 16, the fifth 32, and the sixth 64. These numbers, however, are a reference only, and they may vary according to the pot's tolerance. If we patch the 2 to the nth power output to Brinsus volt per octave input, we can hear that the oscillator is now tuned to semitones. Changing the knob allows us to increase or decrease the number of upper random voltages that we can have. As usual,
usual, we can use the clock output to trigger an envelope and then control Branson's amplitude. The N plus one circuit, which works with octaves, works in the same way, except that its knob increases the random voltage number by a linear progression. One outputs two voltages, two outputs three voltages, three outputs four voltages, and so on until six, which outputs seven random voltages. We can voltage control the N number of these circuits independently via these inputs here. For example, we can patch our attenuated LFO to control the N number of the N plus one circuit. You can hear that as the LFO goes higher, we have more voltages, and vice versa. In both circuits, the N knob acts as an offset. Being these musical intervals, the most apparent application is pitch modulation, but the N knob allows us to patch these voltages wherever we need control over the number of random values. This is an excellent example of randomness taming. For example, in this patch we used 2 to the end power to modulate the center position of the parametric scanner downwards. So as soon as we increase the N number, Fumana creates some notch that go further down the spectrum. We use the clock to trigger an envelope to close the notch filter. If we voltage control the N number, we can hear that our LFO makes our scooping deeper down the spectrum. The last random generator is the fluctuating random voltage. It is a sample and hold circuit like the other ones, but its outputs are integrated by a time constant that makes the transition smooth and seamless. We designed the integrator so that it provides a smooth fluctuation at every clock speed. And this is the only sample and hold circuit which is not affected by the main clock and by the manual gate section. It is entirely independent with its own clock and its rate is set by this knob over here. It can create slow changes which are great for evolving textures like drones. On the other hand, this circuit affects the main clock. Remember the random clock output? The fluctuation speed affects its rate of change, so how often it should change the main clock's behavior. For example, in this patch we used the main clock to trigger an envelope that controls the parametric scanner gain, and we used the random clock output to trigger another envelope that controls the parametric scanner width. In this way you can hear the behavior of both clocks. At a fast rate we obtain a very frantic behavior in both less than and more than modes. With a very slow global rate of change, we can experience more prolonged silences when the random clock is set to less than mode, and uh, almost a copy of the main clock when it's set in more than mode. And this is because it almost never deviates from the norm. The rate of change is voltage controllable as well, and its modulation affects both the fluctuation speed and the clock's random behavior. Finally, there is the probability distribution. We say that Sapel's noise is true random and thus wholly unpredictable. This is true, but it needs further clarification. Being sampled on thermal noise, Sapel's random voltages retain the noise's Gaussian distribution, which means that the median values have a higher probability of appearing than the lower and the higher ones. We shot a video on randomness and pseudo-randomness that you can watch here or in the description. 
However, sometimes we may need other behaviors and that is where the probability distribution kicks in. This control allows us to shift the most probable magnitude towards the higher or the lower voltages. Once defined, we can activate it independently per each circuit. When the probability distribution knob is in the central position, it will have the same Gaussian distribution as when this control is disabled. Please note that this setting will not block the sample and hold circuits from generating different voltages than those whose probability is higher. They will just be generated less frequently. This is a significant difference, for example, from the N knobs function of the quantizer on the voltages. In that case, the N number defines the pool of values that may be picked, and here, on the contrary, the probability distribution knob sets the magnitude of voltages that are more likely to be generated within the pool selected above. Since the probability distribution also affects the fluctuating random voltages, as a consequence it also affects the global rate of change, so the density of the random clock outputs. If we set the clock in more than mode, rotate the global rate of change all the way counterclockwise and the probability distribution to its lower state, we can achieve a sort of a copy of the main clock. Now everything that we said applies to one section, but there is also another one. And if we needed to generate more random voltages at the same time, we can cross-patch the yellow clock output to the clock input of the green section. In this way, we will generate six random voltages at the same time. The last thing that we need to mention are the four noise outputs. These output four kinds of analog noise. Let us start from the white noise. This has an equal distribution of energy per bandwidth. It means that every frequency has the same amplitude as the other ones. But since our here has a sort of logarithmic response to amplitude, this noise will sound slightly unbalanced towards the high register. For this reason we added also the pink noise, which is a noise with a minus 3 dB per octave filter. As a result, it has an equal distribution of energy per octave. It will thus sound very balanced to our ear, both in the low and in the high register. If we need an even more filtered noise, we have the red noise, which has a minus 6 dB per octave filter. It will sound more like a low rumbling tone. And finally we have the blue noise, which increases its amplitude towards the high register. It is much sharper and it almost lacks the low end. It can be great for cymbals and other percussive effects. Let us then compare the four noise outputs. This is the blue noise. This is the white one, this is the pink noise, and this is the red noise. These are excellent tools for sound shaping purposes. For example, we can use any of the four noise outputs to modulate the spectrum of the brain's oscillator through Fumana's spectral transferring function. In this case, we patch it to the modulation input. You can hear and also see from the white LEDs that the pink noise is the more balanced. But we can also use them as a sound source by patching them to Fumana's main input and use the bands to shape the noise. In this case it will become more apparent where in the frequency range lies the energy of each noise color.